couple here. And um, how long have you been a flat earther? Oh, six months, man. Wow. Six months, dude. I'm a conspiracy theorist, like, pro now, though. <laughs> I'm all about it, man. There you go. I it. love your energy, bro. Oh, man. Yeah, I love the energy of the crowd and everything like that. And that's why I wanted to personally ask people here that live in the Raleigh, Durham area that um, if you're here and you are felt alone for so long and you're like, dude, finally there's a flat earth group I can go to. We don't want you to go back home being alone again. So I got an email address called flat earth group at Gmail. And we'll also be meeting people out there, but go ahead, shoot me like a little email. Be happy to get you taken care of so you're not alone again. Uh, as far as you want to go, if you're also from Cali or wherever and you know, you want to be like, hey dude, can you just tell me if any Cali people just draw me your name? City and state. That's it. I'll hook you up. I'll be like, yo, this person from Cali wants to link up too. There so yeah, happy to help. Happy to help. But yes, thank you guys. Thank you, Always brother. There you go. Thanks, brother. I think I just got some of that from him. Woo. I just had five pots of coffee. He's still going. Yeah. That was the flash. That's Paul. No, that's Paul. That's Paul. He's from here and they're doing meetups. Are you, you're from around here, right? Oh. Oh, well, you know what? No, if you're alone, if you feel alone, they're with you. They're with you. So everybody's with Gino tonight. All right. Are you all with me? All right. Um, I do believe I can see the counter up there is ready to go. But I'm going to ask these guys real quick with my handy dandy earpiece. What's next? What's next? Oh, oh, those guys. The, those guys. Oh, yeah. I knew that. I knew that. These guys are next. Are you guys ready? The entire panel's coming up, huh? This group right here? All right. I love it. Well, please welcome to the stage. Here she comes. I, I love your outfit. Carly Sunshine. Carly Medrano. Gorgeous. Bob Nodell. David Weiss, I'm sorry, buddy. I was high five in you anyway. There you go, Bobby. He was on the news, by the way. This guy was. And he got away with flying a drone in North Carolina illegally, and he's a Yankee. We had bail money just in case. Daryl Marble, come on down. Yes. And of course, your host with the most. The lovely Patricia Steer. Does anybody want to sit here, Robbie? Would you like to join the group? No? I guess you have an empty seat. All right, wonderful. Hello. I'm so happy to be here. Aren't we all happy to be here? I actually can't believe this is really happening, but this is day number two, so it must have sunk in by now. This is so life affirming. I never thought when I started doing Flat Earth and other hot potatoes in 2015 that we'd have a, a conference. But now there's this conference. And then we've got one in the UK coming up, a convention that Gary John is putting on. And then there's something happening in maybe Australia and something happening somewhere in Europe and other ones yet to come all over the US, more mixers and more meetups. and. We used to think when we got started individually in this, whether you're a content provider or you write a book or, or whether you've got a channel or not, that we were alone and that no one thought these things we thought. And wouldn't it be nice to know some of those people making those videos? But now we do know each other. And I think that this whole event is going to have a healing effect on the whole flat earth, in quotes now, community. Because there has been some infighting and there has been some attacks from people who won't let go of their globe. But I think this is going to bring us together and we'll realize when we see each other on YouTube that we're 
we're friends in some sense and family in another sense. And that even if we may have different beliefs, be they spiritually or be they about models, in the end, we have one thing in common. We live on a flat plane and we are the creation of the creator. So, with that in mind, Ah, I want to introduce the panel, which is now complete. Perfect timing. Rich Tavinson. I'm going to ask the panel to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about what their specialty is and what they're known for. And some have already been on the stage, so they'll have to rephrase it again. <laughs> so let's start. Let's start with D I T R H or Ditra or Dirt or Dirt <laughs> first. Maybe it's not on. Mic check. <laughs> He's just like the farms. <laughs> there we go. Um, my YouTube is D I T R H, stands for Deep Inside the Rabbit Hole, for maybe two of you that didn't know that. <laughs> and um, I do a podcast called The Flat Earth Podcast. Easy to remember, flatearthpodcast.com, um, where it's good for beginners and uh, anybody that's just looking for. What's new in Flat Earth? Um, and that's who I am. All right, up next, we're going to go with D Marble, Daryl Marble. Well, my channel's name is D Marble. <laughs> you know, that's just, just my name. Uh, I'm the common sense guy uh, in Flat Earth. I'm just going to keep everything really simple, just show you things that are very observable, repeatable, testable, as science should be. Uh, also, I'll make videos about life. Uh, living in my van or living out of my van from time to time and uh you know talking about some other things but we'll get into that a little bit later perhaps so. thank you Dee. up next we're going to ask carly sunshine to tell us about her channel well my name is carly and i go by carly sunshine on youtube that is my youtube channel <laughs> and, <laughs> Um, I'm also quite active on Facebook. I run over 12 Flat Earth Facebook groups, but my baby is called Flat and Happy, and I'm sure some of you here are in that group. Um, I've been involved in Flat Earth since about February, March of 2015, and I just want to say I'm extremely honored to be here. I, I can't believe that this is um, happening, that, that we're here, that we are, we are changing the world, we are making history. And I just, I don't want to get emotional, but I feel like on the way here that I came home because, you know, we're all here together now. We all, it all makes sense to each other. <laughs> I love all you guys. Thank you for this opportunity. And Bob Nodell, who, because you're so tall, you look like Carly is. <laughs> <laughs> we know you, of course, but tell us a little bit about your channel in case there's one person here who doesn't know. Okay, yeah, my name is Bob Nodell, and uh, I'm the host of the Globebuster Show on YouTube, and we kind of strive to cover the more technical aspects of Flat Earth. And so that's what we do. And a shout out to Cammy Nodell as well. As long as we can. My mic interruption. Rich. You working? Yes. My name is Rich, and my channel is Mr. Thrive and Survive, and I'm not very active on Facebook. <laughs> For those that know me, I'm a, sort of an anti-Facebook. Maybe if I back up, can you still hear me? <laughs> Closer? Okay, as long as we don't get the feedback. Uh, yes, I'm not a big Facebook person, but I do have Mr. Thrive and Survive Facebook. I also have uh, a channel, uh, a website called matrixbusting.com that I have decided now to make that a repository or a depository for guys like you out there to deposit the different scientific papers you come up with, your experiments and different things like that, uh, without commentary, without the, you know, the trolling and the back and forth, uh, just the plain science that you have discovered, like a scientific white paper. I met somebody here, uh, believe it or not, who wasn't even in this conference, uh, who came in from next door and just a happened to catch my speech yesterday and he wants to help 
developed a website. He's a professional website person, which uh, I thank God for that because I'm not. And in a nutshell, my big thing is empirical evidence. And to me, in the long run, empirical evidence is what's going to break the shell and get us to critical mass where it'll be laughed at to say you actually believed in the sphere uh, and that it moved at some point. And I think that point is coming very, very soon uh, as the evidence of worldwide media here, I think, speaks to pretty clearly. Thank you very much. Well, this Flat Earth and Other Hot Potatoes panel show is really about your questions. When I do my show on YouTube, I go into the live chat and I ask people who are there in the chat to ask questions if they want or contribute. And this is really your opportunity to ask questions. But before you go to the microphones that are set up, I think there are two, although I can't see them, and ask questions, um, if you have one, think of, formulate a question if you've got for any of the panel members. I'm going to ask each panel member in the same order that we just went through to tell us what their thoughts are on the future of flat earth, or if you don't even like the term flat earth, uh, non-globular earth. Where do you think this awakening, movement, community, where do you think it's going? And we're going to go with the DITRH with the very first answer. That's a question I've been asked several times today. And uh, my answer is, I don't think it's going away. You know, I keep waiting when I'm in the car driving. I'm like, all right, this flat earth thing, it's just going to go away one day. And, you know, it d didn't seem real. Now I'm here in the largest gathering of flat earthers ever, this time around at least. And it is real. And, uh, you know, next year, um, I'm predicting the conference to be a minimum of twice the size, if not substantially larger, because I don't see anybody waking up to flat earth and going back. Um, it just doesn't happen. So, you know, it's literally the matrix. We've all taken the red pill and the stake and the blue pill is out of the question. You can't go back even if you want to. So um, I see it happening rather quickly. Uh, I like that Jaron threw down the gauntlet that NASA is going to be done this year. I'm holding them to it. And uh, when that happens, the world is going to change. So we will see what the elite do to try to protect their biggest secret ever, the one that they uh, protect with NASA and, you know, every other agency, you know, the Hollywood, everything, in my opinion, is to protect their lie of, uh, of heliocentricity. So... I think it's coming. Let's see what they do to try to stop it. Um, I don't think anyone is going back to sleep. And uh, I see the world changing. Perfect. And when it comes, living without fear is one of the ways that we're going to get through it. Daryl, what's your answer to the same question? Where are we going? Where we're going? Where no man has gone before. No, no uh, that'd be fake space. But um, the <laughs> The future of Flat Earth, uh, I'm seeing this is going to be, uh, as has been said before, as I said uh, on stage yesterday, is, uh, we're headed towards a tipping point because uh, pretty much like Dave just said, once you go flat, you don't go back. You know, uh, nobody's going back to be believing in the globe. So I've said this a few times, within five years, Flat Earth is going to be common knowledge and uh, it's going to be just uh, embarrassing to... Uh, have been duped to believe that we're on a spinning ball rocket, as Rand, Rand Campbell says, flying through space, uh, you know, monkeys turning into people and all that. It's going to be laughable in a rather short period of time. So uh, we have absolutely nothing to worry about, as you can see here. Uh, saturation is coming. So that's where I see it. Thank you. And now when I see the globe, it provokes laughter in me whenever I see the globe. Same thing. I look at my iPhone. I see the globe icon. I'm like, oh, what are you, what are you, who are you kidding here? Well, the same question is now to be posed to Carly Sunshine. Where do you see this awakening going? Carly. Well, um, very similar to what I'm sure the rest of us, how the rest of us feel. You know, I agree with the idea of uh, critical mass coming, tipping point. We're going to be changing the education system, but I also <laughs> I also take a little different view as far as I look at it from more of like a humanity standpoint. Um, 
flat earth is allowing us all to understand who we are as humans and where we came from and that we are intelligently designed um, and that we have so much phenomenal potential. And in my mind, I see that that's a, a huge rift in the world right now and, and we're moving towards that now. So if, if where I see flat earth in the future is us starting to heal humanity so that we, we understand our potential and how important we are and that's why we're realizing that the earth is flat because it is intelligently designed. This is created for us. That's where I see this going. Wonderful, Carly. And I think it's no accident that you speak of healing and I spoke of healing. I think I'm not saying that men and women are, it's a woman's thing. I think we do think along those lines oftentimes about bringing around the peace. All right. Up next, Bob Nodal, where do you think this ship is going? Well, I'm, I'm really pleased with, with where it has gone. Um, we've made a lot of progress in the past two years, uh, two and a half years that we've been doing the show and uh, seen a lot more people join the movement. Um, but I wish I could say that I, I believed that it was going to be all, you know, flowers and rosy and everything. But I think that we're going to be running across some hard times because the people that are in control of this world are not going to that, give that control up easily. Um, and we can expect a fight. I mean, we're already starting to see it manifest in YouTube where, you know, all the truthers are essentially getting their channel shut down for even talking about, you know, some of the other conspiracies out there like, you know, Las Vegas or anything like that. And, uh, you know, let's face it, Flat Earth is, is the biggest, it's the granddaddy of all conspiracies. And when we start coming out with enough evidence that is really uh, persuasive, um, and we start presenting this information to the universities and we start appealing to the professionals, the scientists, the physicists, the engineers out there and get them to start asking questions um, at that point uh, and leading up to that point, I believe that uh, we're going to be in for quite a battle. And uh, uh, but in the long run, I really believe that that uh, I have faith in humanity and uh, I, I think that, you know, ultimately we can pull this off, but it's not going to be an easy road. So that's where I think we're at. I agree, Bob. It's a challenge for all of us who are in the know to become our better selves and be an example. People say this is a leadership movement, but we all can lead by example. And one of the things when you find out about this truth that burns within you is the desire to communicate it to other people, to wake other people up. And it's not easy. My brother won't even talk to me anymore. And I know we all have similar stories, but I do think that's part of what we need because like Bob was saying, we're going to be facing some strong attack. So if we have more members of the, I guess army is a little bit warlike, but I'll just say army at this point, um, it'll make it easier because we have more of us. And this right here is, is, is a good start, right? <laughs> So, um, Richard Hopkins, or shall I just call you Thrive? What's your answer to the same question? <laughs> I'll give you a two-part answer, short-term and long-term, what I think is going to happen anyway. Nobody knows the future, but we can, from current trends, kind of get a little bit of a, an idea. I'm going to start out by saying that nobody in this movement, or whatever you want to call it, died and left somebody the shill police. Uh, and that is a cancer that is growing in the community, so to speak, where... Um, People think they have the authority to call other people shills and things like that. That is internal cancer uh, that is best solved by just ignoring it. Simply ignoring it, unsubscribe, forget them. The other short-term issue is now that we have so much empirical evidence that we've been lied to about the earth and about many other things, uh, all the whole cosmology, um, we're going to face an issue of now determining, trying to determine what the model is. And my caution with that is remember that you were programmed to react as laughter or to reject flat earth when you first heard it. This, this comes from the education system when we were all children and it just built all the way up. And now that we're going to be looking at different models, remember that if you don't have empirical evidence that says it's round or square or in this, uh, you know, a slice of pizza shape, whatever, that keep your mind open is what I'm saying. Don't be dogmatic and say, no, it's got to be the Asimov Ecuadorial. And it may be that one. It may be. 
but until we get enough evidence to try to narrow it down, and I personally don't think we will ever know it all. First of all, we don't have the funding like NASA has, you know? You know, the, the biggest thing we have is to put balloons together and P900s and things like that. Eventually, we will have funding, I believe, uh, that will come from people saying, finally, let's stop sending billions of tax dollars each year to NASA. Because what have they produced for humanity? Absolutely nothing. I think they produce tang, maybe. Yeah, tang, that's right. We have dried chemical uh, orange juice right. from, from NASA. <laughs> Long term, flat earth that I believe is part, a major part, maybe the, the, the biggest part of the gateway drug to truth. Uh, someone very famously once said, the truth shall set you free. And the flat earth truth and many other truths are now, if you haven't noticed, coming out in the woodwork. They're not totally exposed yet, but they're getting there. We have a bunch of political corruption all over the world that I believe is slowly being unraveled right now. We want it to end today and be over with. But it's going to take some time. And um, as several people have said up here, it isn't going to be an easy road. And the thing to do is remember, and this is one thing that I've noticed that I did not expect, there's a separation. The people that believe in flat earth, they have the good fruits of humanity for the most part. Whereas the other side, it's filled with hatred and vitriol and spewing out anger. You can see that division. Anybody that looks at a comment thread on any one of the channels. And just remember, good will overcome evil as long as you keep producing good fruits and don't buy into all that. So you all in the audience, I can't, and those watching either now or in the future on video, I can't stress it enough that each individual is a cell in this body of truth that is trying to now be opened up this envelope that's been hidden. Uh, all the lies we've been told, they're being ripped away and the truth is coming out of the bottle. So keep up the good fruits, combine one another with one another uh, to help the movement whatever which way you can, but stay on the good side. And you all, I mean, it just warms my heart uh, meeting most of you people here that, that I've gotten to know even just a little bit. Uh, it actually brings tears to my eyes almost, uh, the goodness that I sense and feel with all the people uh, that are here. And that is a major thing not to forget that this movement brings. So. A great positive end note, Rich. We get accused, content providers, even those who are don't make videos and don't even have channels, they don't even comment, of being agents. And guess what? We all are agents. Shh. We're agents of truth. And our role, we decided one day to look at a video, read a book, and something clicked on inside us. I don't even think it had anything to do with us. It's almost as if we were directed to the material. So here's to the agents, all of us. Agents of light. And helping others to see that light is really a noble, noble thing to do. And if you just wake up your dog or cat, that's good enough, right? <laughs> Okay, so we may ask the panel other questions as uh, individually as time permits, but I would like to give you the opportunity to ask questions. And so we have lines formed, and Rick Hummer is manning a line, and we've got another, I can't see, because it's quite blinding up here. Um, and we'll just start taking questions, and I'm not sure who they'll be directed to, but please state the panel member that you'd like the question answered by, and let's begin on this side. Brian's here from Nashville. Go ahead, Brian. My question isn't generally directed at anybody in particular on the panel, but what I'd like to ask you is your thoughts on the Antarctic. Uh, the reason I asked that question is almost a year ago, maybe a little more than a year ago, um, our vice president before the election re-signed an additional treaty in the Antarctic, essentially cutting it off from us. So my question to you is what are your thoughts on the Antarctic and how do we as a group try to probe and find truth in that area? Good question, but can you, it, did you say the Arctic? It sounded like Antar Arctic. Antarctic. The Antarctic, Arc or Arctic. It was quite hard to hear up here. So 
not, not necessarily anybody in particular, but maybe somebody uh, that would volunteer. Right. Who would as like to knowledge. handle that question? Class. <laughs> He's got it. <laughs> um, so you want to know what, what our thoughts are on Antarctica. Antarctica um, is pretty much cut off to the average human being. Um, you know, you can go there. You can go on a trip, a very guided trip. Um, if you tried to go there on your own, I'm not sure if they would stop you, but you'd probably just run out of supplies and, and not do well in that environment. I believe that uh, whatever is past the shoreline of Antarctica that many people refer to as the ice wall um, is an answer to where we live, whether there's an end or it goes on forever. I don't know. I haven't been there and, and I don't think anybody in this room has. Um, I also think the Arctic, uh, the North, um, is another place that will give us many answers. And we all uh, have no desire to go to the North Pole because we're all shown the same National Geographic video, those guys with the dogs going to the North Pole, freezing, frozen beards. Remember, we all saw that in school. And, oh, we're there, and we're freezing to death, and we hope we can get back if we had to eat two of the dogs. Um, <laughs> you know, so I believe the answers to where we live are there, and, and that's why um, it's pretty guarded or, or hard to get to. That's Good my answer. opinion. Good answer. We'll take the next question from this side. Hi, I'm Joe Beth. I'm from San Antonio. And my question is for Dave, um, David Weiss. <laughs> yeah. So I've heard you, I love your podcast, by the way. And I've heard you talk about primary water. And I want you to talk more about that as it relates to the, to the, our realm, our flat earth realm. All right, so I'll touch on this quickly. Um, there, there, we're, we're all taught that, you know, with the water cycle on the earth is evaporation condensation. You know, it evaporates clouds, storms, rains, and that's the cycle of water. But that's really secondary water. That's not where our water comes from. And I think um, from everything we all learned here, the water's above and the water's below, there's a lot more water. Um, Gaddafi found an ocean of water below the deserts when he was looking for oil and was piping it all through Africa, built the Great Man-Made River. Many of you have seen uh, a video I did on that. Um, just look for it, the Great Man-Made River under my YouTube channel. And that is the primary water of this planet. Um, so you just said planet. You just said planet, dude. Get oh, him no, out of here. I did. I'm out. Get him out of here. <laughs> See? I am, I am not fully programmed. I'm deprogrammed. <laughs> I'm, you are the I'm, weakest. I am, I am confirmed shill 100%. Security. <laughs> Security. Security. So, so that, that's what primary Good water degrees. is. That's Good why degrees. they don't let us dig uh, wells uh, beyond three, 400 feet or whatever it is. Because, you know, if they did that in California, they would hit unlimited water. And uh, can't have that. So uh, if you want to learn more about that, there's a website called primarywater.org. Check it out. Thank you very much, Dave. Thank you for the question. We go over to Rick. Ryan's over here. Where are you from, Ryan? I'm from Florida. All right, what's your question? Um, I'm just curious. Uh, this is for anybody on the uh, panel who has thoughts about this. Um, given the last couple of years, the increasing saliency in Flat Earth, and you know, it was on ESPN with Kyrie Irving and you know, Obama and Kerry said it on the news and, you know, people are starting to hear about it. And obviously there's a lot of, you know, kind of buzz going on, most of it negative. Um, and I know from talking to a lot of people here the last couple of days, a lot of us kind of came to it the same way, which is this is dumb. It's going to take me 20 minutes to disprove this. And here we all are. Um, I'm wondering if any of you guys has um, any thoughts on the um, why we don't have somebody yet from um, the Jet Propulsion Lab or the Army Corps of Engineers or uh, Caltech, you know, somebody who is, has four PhDs and has heard this and has went through the same kind of thing that we have and gone, all right, I'm going to, you know, shut all these idiots up and why we're not seeing that quite yet. What's it going to take for us to get, you know, that kind of uh, element into, into the group? Excellent question. Anybody, but D-I-T-R-H can take that. <laughs> Bob? Okay. Well, I guess I would respond to that with uh, another question, and that would be, what makes you think we don't? <laughs> and the reason I say that is because we we are in contact with people uh, of, of higher degrees, ed engineers and physicists, um, that simply do not want their name put out there because of their you know what it could do to their, their their professional career. 
Okay, so I, I'm here to tell you that yes, there is absolutely an interest from highly educated people in college level positions and very high corporate positions. And, uh, you know, they have to look out for themselves, just like all of us, because anybody that's ever come out, you know, in favor of this movement obviously gets viciously attacked. And the first thing they try and do is decred, you know, completely take away any credibility that they have. And uh, you can't blame them for wanting to avoid that. But the answer is, there are people. So there you have it. As I overheard Rich just say, boom. So there you go. All right, we're going to go right over here and get we the have next Gino. question. Hi, Gino from Connecticut. I'm going to try not to make this a long-winded question. So I've been involved in ministry since 1993 and prior to the Flat Earth when I clicked on it in 2013. My main source of creationism was from ICR or Answers in Genesis. And I, uh, when I spent the year doing my due diligence with the Flat Earth, I contacted ICR and Answers in Genesis, but never got any response back. And I I don't know if any of you in the higher echelon of what's the Flat Earth Movement, have we contacted them? Because they're not doing anything on the Flat Earth. I listen to them somewhat regularly, but, uh, you know, they're the mainstream Christian, you know, creationist. And to answer the question that was asked in the beginning, where do you see it going? I see this going from where they left off because they're not talking about this at all. And I see this as an extension of creationism. I'm not sure who would like to answer that question. Um, it would have to be coming from us. Uh, yeah, exactly. From a strong Christian background. And I know that there are those beliefs, but I just, does anybody want to handle it? Carly? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I can say that personally, I've never, you know, contacted any of these people, but I, what I can say is that there are people already, you know, in the movement, people like Rob Skiba and Zen Garcia, um, people who are active voices in the community who are getting this, this word out and they are supporting creation. And I think we just need to give it a little bit more time. Um, I, I'm sure there are people here in the community though, that have tried to contact, you know, other Christian leaders and other um, people that do like seminars and conferences like this. But I do think uh, just like with the rest of the community, there's going to be a tipping point And I, I believe that that's going to change. I was talking uh, um, about people like um, Bill Schnoblin. Uh, he was with the Prophecy Club for a while. He, I think his, um, I think his YouTube channel is called With One Accord. And and he is now a flat earther. So, I mean, it is spreading. So I think, and if there are other people out there that know even more information, I think we should share it with each other. If it's going to motivate you to know that, you know, it's spreading as far in the Christian community as well um, with the rest of us, then that's, you know, that's a plus. So I hope that gives you some hope. <laughs> Correct. You're right. Keep pressing. And also, if you yourself know a pastor, a minister, a rabbi, a fill in the blank, school teacher, whatever it may be, and I know it might be hard, you might be that one person with just a quick note, a quick email that pushes them over the tipping point. Or you might be the entree, the very first person who ever told them about it. They might ignore you, they might block and delete you, but then more people and more people will continue basically tapping on their mental door. And then one moment they'll say, I probably should look into this. But each one of us can be responsible to, to make that happen. So if you have an opportunity, definitely speak up. Next, Rick. All right, Keith from Delaware. Uh, my question is open to anyone on the panel that wants to answer, but um, there's a lot of information, there's a lot of content, there's a lot of uh, conversation in general. And anything you guys hear that kind of makes you maybe cringe when you hear it, it's, it's pro flat earth, but you hear it, you kind of cringe and say, it's not really the best argument. It's not really good data. You don't believe it's true or anything of that, you know, that nature. That's Can I really say some question? I hate the word globe tard. Yes. And I, I hate the word globe head. I hate any negative connotation thrown back. That's just my personal opinion. I'm yeah. not on the panel though. I'll agree with that completely. <laughs> I'm not the content cop of flat earth at all. And I believe everyone should do their channel or do whatever they do 
um, the way they see fit. But I do think that anything that would be demeaning, as if we're on a higher plane and we're talking down low to people, will set some people off. So trying to be polite and respectful to people who don't know yet, because everyone's a flat earther and they just haven't figured it out yet. And so, right. Thank you. Really good point. Up next. We have Michael from Raleigh. Questions for David. David, I was chatting with Robbie before, and he had mentioned that there's considerable media coverage here, and I know that you've done some interviews. So my question is, what's your assessment of how that coverage has been for the conference? Well, so far it's been excellent, because the only thing I've seen was me on TV last <laughs> night. <laughs> um, I hear, I hear uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of news here, um, a lot of different channels, and they seem to be doing a lot of reporting. Uh, Jaron and I were at the billboard this morning with Vice uh, for HBO, and uh, it all went beautiful. Let's see what happens after the editing room. Uh, I, I believe that, that these uh, journalists here will be honest. Um, I've talked to some of them off camera, and they're all asking flat earth questions. They are... Uh, they are flat earth curious um, and globe skeptical. And um, so, so I, 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 this is the, the, the best media turnout I've seen so far. And I think it'll have a lot of repercussions uh, in the coming days. And uh, for those of you that don't know, that is Mike, Mike Williams, Sage of Quay, <laughs> asking yes. the question. Yes. Awesome channel, Sage Subscribe of Quay on YouTube. Best interviews ever especially when he has me on. And a very good musician as well, Sage of Quay Radio Hour. Subscribe. Um, Rich Hopkins, Mr. Thrive and Survive, would also like to address that question. Thank you, very good question. I happened to kiss just before I came here, and I don't know if they're still here, but uh, it doesn't matter, I'm gonna call them out on it anyway. I saw CBS Philadelphia, they reported that we were here, and as you all know, gone are the days of unbiased reporting. Uh, you know, I can remember growing or up. reporting in general, really. Yeah. Um, so uh, to me, there's a couple of things, and this ties in with the other question about what do I cringe about certain things. When I hear President Obama or other people in high places say things like, we don't need a gathering of the Flat Earth Society. Well, Flat Earth Society is, as most of you know, that is a true shill place. That is disinformation. Where have they been during all of this? That's a good question to ask yourself. Yeah. And as, I can't remember his name, but as a representative, longtime Democratic representative from Massachusetts said, nothing in politics is by accident. So, and you know that because the talking point is to say the flat earth society, and you go there and see all kind of weird things and turn it off. But getting back to CBS Philadelphia, when they mentioned that there was a sold out conference in North Carolina, it was only like, I believe a 38 second piece. You could hear the cameraman actually laughing when they went to go and show, you know, people here. Then when they came back, the anchor actually concluded the segment with something very close to this. It's hard to believe people like that live among us, or I want to remind you that these people are living amongst us. Can you believe that? So, it hasn't gotten to the point yet where it is, it's very far from socially acceptable not to comment negatively about it. And, and until that changes, I think the press is going to be, if we're lucky, neutral. But right now, I, I see way too much biased negative press. Very good question. Yes. And the press that's here, most hopefully, will, um, I don't expect them to become instant flat earthers, but when they have some time, look into a few videos yourselves. We are not crazy. Next question over here with Rick. Michael from Indiana. Indiana! <laughs> We're alone again. Here we go. This is a question with the balloon launchers. Maybe Bob can answer this one all the balloon launch videos i've seen have come from like a hundred uh, 120 thousand feet right mm -hmm. maybe the top three hundred thousand uh if you're <laughs> i know it's kind of skeptical it's, it's debatable right i've seen i've seen uh a few videos on it but uh my question is uh 
it, it's debatable. Probably it depends on where you're at on the AE map. When you launch them, the highest around the North Pole, maybe, you know, the highest. And then maybe the lowest, well, we can't go to Antarctica, maybe uh, Australia for the lowest part. So anyway, can we get a team to go to these areas and compare that altitude feet? Also, what is causing these balloons to pop? The firmament? Is it even possible to create an anti-popping firmament balloon? Yeah. Entrepreneurs, take note. <laughs> All right. Bob, I think you'd be great at answering this one. Yeah. Okay. Well, we, we have launched a few balloons. One, our first one wasn't too successful, but our second one was, one was fabulous. But what causes the balloons to pop? Um, they will only gravity? expand. Sorry. Yeah, it's okay, gravity. <laughs> They'll only expand so much, and of course, as as the balloon rises, um, the helium or hydrogen, whatever you want to fill it with, on the inside expands, and it continues to expand because the external barometric pressure on the balloon becomes less and less and less. Okay, so there becomes a point where you know you go way past any type of equilibrium, and the helium inside of it just keeps it expanding. All right, and there's only so much elasticity to the the balloon. So it gets to a point, um, you know, usually between 100, maybe 100, what, 130,000 130, feet, 130, feet, roughly, something like that. Um, and, and that's it. That's all she wrote. And it explodes. And uh, there's not a lot we can do about that at this point. But yes, there probably are ways to increase the elasticity and maybe get a little bit higher uh, out of it. But, you know, you can spend a small fortune in balloons, believe me. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Perfect question. Now I think, because I think we're pressed for time, that we should try to make our answers up here really quick. I don't mean yes and no, but pretty quick. <laughs> and maybe your questions faster as well, if you can. We're going to go over to this side. This is Brooke from Denver, Colorado. Really fast. First of all, thank you guys all for the work that you do here. Um, I would like to ask what you your knowledge is on the wind patterns on a flat earth model versus a globe. I don't know who wants to tackle that question, if at all anyone. D-I-T-R-H comes to the rescue. <laughs> Are you talking about no? wind patterns at the surface or up high? Um, maybe explaining like why they put the windmills where they put the windmills and is it, you know, you know just where the, the wind comes from and how it circulates. Okay. Uh, wind is generated by, in its simplest form, unequal heating of the Earth's surface. Uh, if back, if you believe in the uh, biblical account, and I do, uh, that there was probably a canopy that kept the sun from causing too much difference in the uh, the hottest versus the coldest places on Earth. So there was probably very little wind, also with no rain back in Noah's day. Now, once that canopy broke up and the sun comes out, then you obviously have wherever the sun is closest to over the Earth more heating. Uh, but it's it's even simpler than that. Uh, if people that live near the ocean will tell you that you have a sea breeze generally in the morning and a land breeze during the day, or maybe it's backwards. I always get that mixed up. But anyway, what happens is the land warms faster than the ocean during the day. That air lifts, and to fill the void, what uh, air comes in from the ocean to fill that void. So you get this circulation, and wind starts. Windmills are usually placed offshore at strategic places where not only that occurs, but where you have great differences in high and low pressure systems, which is back to temperature again, where you have great temperature uh, changes. Now here on the East Coast, you'll notice after a cold front goes through in particular, the wind will pick up and it will get very windy, especially after a snowstorm. And this is because cold air is rushing in to fill the warm air that's vacating. Uh, and this, this is true all the way up until you get into the mid to higher levels of the atmosphere where the heating and cooling is not that much difference. But then you get into what's called the jet streams. And they generally flow west to east, which would be actually contradictory to the Earth spinning. They, they're, they're going against the Earth spin, so explain that. Um, what actually causes them to move in that direction, I'm not exactly sure, but they all move west to east. Um, in the northern hemisphere anyway, uh, even in the southern hemisphere. But that, I mean, that, it's a, I'm sorry, that, that, that's about as fast as I can make an answer 
complicated that, that makes sense without going on for 20 minutes. So thank thanks. you for the question and for the answer. We're going to go next over here. Uh, hi, my name's Joseph. I'm from Archdale uh, here in North Carolina. Um, my question is just for anyone up there who wants to answer it. But um, every time I watch a flat earth video on YouTube, I notice that video on the side that talks about that mountain that looks like the stump of a giant tree or things being bigger than what they are now. I just want to know your thoughts on that. Well, I know that that uh, comes from a time of giants living um, maybe below the earth or living on earth and different levels of oxygen in, in a long time ago. And then, of course, we had no forests on flat earth, make a big splash. And that, uh, well, I don't know who would like to address that topic. Carly. She looks excited. <laughs> so, <laughs> so for anyone that's not familiar with the, the video that's probably sparking this question, it was a video called There Are No Forests on Flat Earth. And this might, you know, push the limits with the media, but <laughs> you know, check into it and with an open mind. Um, and the concept is, is that at one point in time, the things that we see now, like mesas, which are giant mountains that are flat on top, um, were at one point gigantic trees, and somehow they were cut, or uh, we're not sure, but the tops of the trees are gone because there are some people out there saying that the the, what's left is just a, a petrified tree. Um, but as far as you're wanting to know our opinion on how, how that would work as far as the, on the flat earth, I mean, I've, I've video logged about this before and I can definitely see from a biblical standpoint how this could be um, logical, especially talking about, um, Rich was talking about a canopy at one point in time, which would change the way wind and weather would work if we have these massive massive trees, and I know it's very hard to, to fathom, um, it would change the oxygen in, in the air, um, but they would also give off, well, they would give off more oxygen and they would use up more of our carbon dioxide. Um, and there are stories biblically of there being creatures that lived longer and, and grew bigger and that there were things like giants. And I know this is quite, sounds like fantasy, but um, you know, biblically that it, it makes sense. And also if you are adhering to earth, having a terrarium like structure or an enclosed system or a firmament or a dome, it makes sense to me that if we had these massive trees, uh, that the environment inside would be super oxygenated. And that's why we would have, you know, creatures that live longer and grew bigger. And uh, we might've been able to sustain things like giants. Um, Earth was, I think, just very different at one point in time. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> and, uh, we all know Thank the story you. of Jack and the Beanstalk and some of those stories that we tell children may have some truth to them. But also the whole no forest on flat earth could also be straight up disinformation. It is not anything where all flat earthers will agree on it. Some people refuse to even look. Some people look and think it's garbage and other people think it's fascinating. So I'm saying that only for the reporters who are here. We are not all united on that particular topic and it's not particularly flat earth actually, but when you get involved in flat earth it's a whole can of worms and we all know all the other things we look at all of the time all right next question is right here with rick uh go ahead brandon, uh, brandon from maryland a uh, long time listener thanks to this convention no longer closeted flat earther <laughs> yes we know the closeted flat earthers are out there so uh, my question goes to mr nodell um i love learning and as it's been said at the convention many times we all have qualities that allow us to speak and reach to people others that others may not be able to um, one way i feel i can do this is um, by experimentation um, with the fe core that was just recently launched will there be educational material on there that help that will help people like myself to learn to launch, launch weather balloons or to repeat um, the michigan experiment say in bolivia on the salt flats Great question. And Bob, as a member of FE Corps? Okay. Well, you know, we, we haven't talked about, you know, what educational material will be provided. Um, uh, the purview of it is, is to be able to carry out experiments. So rather than us providing the education out, we will, we, we will reveal our research re results, okay? But I don't think it will be in a training type of format. Now, the other way around is that, you know, when, when we open this to the general public to allow them to submit experiments to us, of course, you're going to have to come up with, you know, a description of your experiment, uh, rough costs, things like that, and, and how it would be carried out. 
and then it would be reviewed by the board. And then if it's if it's approved to be, actually be manifest, then uh, you know we will start the process to actually bring that experiment into reality. But as far as educational materials, I don't think so. At least not initially. That may be something in the future that that, that we discuss. All right. Thank you. Very Shoot much, an Bob. email to uh, learn more at fecore.org. That goes for me. Learn more at fecore.org. Thank you, Rick. You have that radio announcer voice. Next question over here. I have a huge question for my man Daryl right here. Yeah, dude. I got. I need a passionate answer, especially for the media, man. But with this flat Earth fact and a lot of conspiracy facts that we've also heard, man, when you hear someone tell you, "Hey, you know what, Daryl? I just don't think this affects me. I don't know why it should matter or who should care." What is your most passionate, best answer that you can give to someone with that kind of an ignorant statement? <laughs> yep. Well, uh, such a statement, well, obviously, a little bugs me a little bit, Paul. Yeah. You know that. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't matter. It doesn't affect me. Uh, that's, um, in my opinion, a very selfish uh, stands to take because it, it just shows that you don't hold your neighbor's life in high regard. You don't, you're not too worried about your kids being lied to. You're not worried about your friends being lied to. Uh, this is something that affects each and every one of us uh, in some way, shape, or form. And for someone to take that stance, it just uh, speaks volumes about their character and doesn't speak a uh, very positive tone, in my uh, opinion. But... <laughs> There are so many things that we've been deceived about that need to be exposed, and I see this as somewhat of a gateway drug, as was said, to every other truth. This is pretty much going to open the door to so many other things that we've been deceived about. And uh, for someone to just disregard this, the very nature of our reality, as something that doesn't matter, it just shows a degree of shallow thinking and lack of consideration and just... Uh, blatant disregard for your fellow man. So, in my opinion, this is one of the most important things that uh, we could share and uh, discuss. So, yes. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Next question over here, please. Hi, I'm Robin from Pennsylvania. Um, hey! <laughs> and you're FE! <laughs> okay, um, mine's for the FE core. Uh, how I came to Flat Earth, I was my thought process was already primed because years ago the Lord was showing me things that um, there are two entities, period. There's Yahweh and there's Lucifer. Everything that is of this world is from him. And I, then the more I researched, the more I delved into it, the more I realized I didn't know. And the more I had to stay humble and the more I had to rethink and that his tendrils are in everything we, in our existence. I, you had me up until the gentleman said the reason it took us, you know, we had to scramble to get the 501c3. Now, in my research, I found out that's a Luciferian contract. So why would you go back to the same government we do not trust for their support when they can come and put the squeeze on you at any time? with this contract? I can answer that. I can answer that. Yeah. Go ahead then. Um, yes. The reason why is because in order for us to get funding and international funding by big names, you have to have a platform. And a 501c3 is going to protect everybody as far as when it comes to playing the game properly. And just so you know, I, I, I'm not afraid to admit it, I put it under my own social security number because I believe God's watching over this project. I have faith, and I'm not afraid of any man nor any government. Right. Okay? They're not going to put the squeeze. They can, they can squeeze me out. They look, look, I want to show you something. Look on the back of my neck. Pull that down. What do you see back there? Oh, it's a tattoo. And it says Alpha and Omega in one symbol. So if they ever come to cut my head off, the last they're going to see is who's got my back. Okay? Thank you, Rick. And uh, we do work, all of us, within... We, we, YouTube content providers are dealing with YouTube, Google, Facebook, Great question, though. Twitter. And I'm glad because we all did, of we these did. are platforms that are controlled by the powers that should not be. But 
what what it, smoke signals is what we should use. We're going to use what we've got until we find a better way. And working toward that better way, well, that's why we're all here. Sorry, say that again? You're not what restricted? Mm. Give her the mic, John, so we can all hear this. <laughs> Five hundred one C three is a tax exempt status that most churches put themselves under, and they're also then controlled about what they can teach, and what they can share, and what they can support, but they don't aren't aware there's a 508 status that gives them the same exemptions without as many restrictions. So if you're really wanting to be able to have a platform that allows you to take donations, but does not limit your content, your content. So what you're saying is they, they can, they can, so the 501c3, they can control the content in which we do. Oh, and they will. Yeah. Okay. So and you're, you're considered a government agency. You well, the beautiful thing is we found out that, the the, okay, hang on. This, this is how God works. When I left on Monday, the last thing I did was I went and took this package. I'm glad you did this. This is an answered prayer. Maybe I dropped the package off in the mail, but I put it in a sturdy envelope and dropped it in the mail. By the time I got here on Tuesday, I got a phone call from the guys back at the office and they said, Hey, uh, this envelope you sent just came back. You didn't put enough packaging on there, enough wow. stamps. So thank you. I know, and I would like to talk to you after this because we are actually working with the foundation group out of Nashville, Tennessee, that's doing this. Jaron did a bunch of work. And I, Jaron, I don't know if Jaron's in here or not, but he did a bunch of work getting this thing started. So <clears throat> once we did this and we realized, wow, we got to really do this by the book, the best thing that we, the best thing that we were told by our consultant was, Go 501c3 because of the exemptions, like you said. And it's, it was more friendly with international money coming in. And maybe that's because of all the missionary work and the government's going to have their hand involved. Maybe you're right there. And I, I truly appreciate that. Thank you. It's a think tank right here. Thank you for that, comments. And thank you very much, Rick. We're right over here now for the next question. I was just wondering about the, uh, the tides and how the moon is supposed to deal with the tides. Mr. Thrive or Bob or scientific uh i know it doesn't deal with large lakes like lake michigan and and whatnot just the oceans um is there any consensus starting on that as far as um whether the moon really does that or if it's uh guided by something else anything about the tides high tide low tide bob and rich perhaps will answer these questions rich first there's a consensus in my mind i don't know if there is with anybody else is this working with <laughs> Uh, I, to me, it goes back to what I said yesterday. It's a Tesla world, not an Einstein world. And everything that I've looked into is answered with, if the earth is a positive magnetically and the moon and or sun are uh, the opposite negative, as it moves over, particularly salt water, which is a lot more conductive to electricity than, you know, fresh water, although fresh water has some properties too, um, the, I, I have to redo this video. Uh, I did a video a long time ago where it shows wherever the moon, I'm just going to stick with the moon for the moment, passes over, everything north of that passage, the water moves away from it and in a, towards the north. Everything to the left of its movement moves away also and bends away towards the south. This is what causes most oceans and air in the northern hemisphere to be to cause clockwise high pressure systems and counterclockwise or anticyclonic uh, in the south. And it's an easy division to see. Now, as far as tides go, there is a definite correlation between the moon and tides, but it's not what we've been told. We've been told if the moon is close to your location, that you will have a high tide. And when it's on the opposite side, you'll have a high tide once again. And when it's in, the, in between, you have the low tides. Well, what I noticed was, for example, in Spain, when the, or let me go with the East Coast of the United States first. When the moon is over the East Coast, and I lived in Maryland and did crabbing and things like that, 
uh, when the moon is close, you tend to have a high tide. It makes sense. But in Spain, when the moon is close, you know, with the, the same longitude, you have a low tide. There is no rhyme and reason with that. But there is a definite correlation with time. If you have at your place uh, a high tide, tides are a little bit difficult because any little change in the ground or how the land is laid out will change tides. Water accumulates and it, it does it by being pushed. And that is a, another property, a physical property of water that most people don't understand. They think science tells us it pulls up. Nothing could be further from the truth. Water doesn't pull up. Water accumulates. And what I believe happens is the moon pushes out in front of it the water. And if, if you go to time and, uh, is it time and date, yeah, uh, timeanddate.com, and just pick any spot and do a correlation with time. You will find that there is a correlation with time, but it doesn't follow high, low tide. It could be a correlation of high tide when the moon is close or low tide or in between. So, and this is easy for anyone to prove, anyone. Just go and do the work. So that's my answer for it. Bob, do you have Thank anything you. to add to that? Um, only that, that water has also diamagnetic properties. Um, and that magnetic fields will cause water to be repulsed away. But there's also another philosophy, another theory that, that comes from like Vedic cosmology. And I'm not so sure that, that I can dismiss it. And that is the idea that water is actually inflowing and outflowing from um, the center of the North Pole, if you will, right? Yeah. Now, I'm going to ask Rick Hummer, since our time clock has gone to zero, 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 zero. We probably only have time for like one or two more questions because right, I know then. you wanted to ask a couple questions before we close. Because dinner's from 4.30 to 6, and we're at about, what, 4.25 so right now? So we're going to have a, a couple more questions, yes. and then I'm not going to ask the panel any more questions. Okay. So, up next. My name is Tony Gallerici. I'm from Abbotsford, British Columbia. And... <laughs> Thanks for coming. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, my question is for Bob, and it is for the FE uh, core. I would like to know if there's anybody who's thought of or possibly uh, getting a telescope of some sort that would be able to track the sun going around the flat Earth um, for 24 hours a day. Mm. Well, that would be that would be quite an engineering feat. <laughs> Uh, I suppose it's possible, but it would it would require it couldn't be done from a single location. Obviously, uh, it would have to be tracked in a plane that is capable of at least um, 1,038 miles an hour. Right? Um, that would be the only way it could be done. I suppose it, it's feasible, um, but I don't really see what practical significance it would necessarily have. I mean, we're, we we can track it from the ground fairly well. So I'm not sure that chasing it from the air would really give us any, any major benefit. And it may not emanate from that spot that we look at anyway. You and the only, really the only plane that we would have is Sophia, and they're not going to let us use that. NASA mm -hmm. won't. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Go ahead. Just to let you know, there are people that are tracking the sun 24-7 around. There is a group uh, that I mentioned yesterday that are tracking sunspots. And 24-7, they, they have observers all around the world constantly reporting back what's going on. So in a sense, we are doing it in a low-tech way. Okay. Low Patricia, tech. we're going to finish these up. We've only got three questions. Next question right here. Uh, Dave Romero from San Diego, California. My question is, how do you think the flat earth or the revelation of flat earth might help with the science of cheap or free energy? Good question. Um, I don't know who would like to tackle that. I'm thinking DITRH, you may have some ideas about free energy. He's got some ideas about everything from what I've <laughs> figured out. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not sure how to answer that question. Uh, one thing I have learned that we are electrical beings and that when we are grounded to the earth, uh, we are healthier and happier. Um, you know, that's why people love being at the beach barefoot. Um, if you're ever not feeling well, not sleeping well, just go out and get on the earth, get walk barefoot in the grass, lay down. And uh, those free electrons that you get um, will make you feel better. Um, how that relates to the flow of energy in your body, um, there's other people that can answer that better than me, but I'm sure it has a profound effect. Yeah. Um, and I just want to add one thing to the person that asked about the, um, the no forest on earth. There's a video called Growing 
megaliths from living stones very interesting i recommend people look at it and decide for yourself what the heck is going on growing right. megaliths from Thank living you stones for that question up next over here hey i'm mac from uh, new westminster british columbia so abbotsford uh, we got to hook up um so my question is um I'll try to narrow it down, but you know, the flat earth community is going every which way. There's a lot of infighting. I mean, the common, um, our goal is to end the enslavement of humanity. And yes, it's great that we're doing more and more experiments to kill the globe, but I mean, the globe's already dead. My fear is, and I like what Daryl said, he kind of answered a little bit, but um, you know, if I've got 30 people that have stopped believing in the globe and now they're like, well, I don't care. I got to go to work, meaning I got to, go on with my enslavement, you know, my fear is that the world is going to wake up to flat earth and the enslavement is still going to be there. Like, uh, I know they say there shouldn't be leaders on flat earth, but in my feeling, like, what do you guys think that there has to be some kind of leadership to focus this in one direction? And that direction is to end the enslavement of humanity, better life for, you know, our children and their children. Well, when there's leaders, that leader can be taken out. And I think that's why we have a leaderless movement at this point. But we all have the ability to exercise leadership roles. So more people stepping up and being in that leadership role, I think, is very necessary because people could easily fall right back, not us, but people can easily fall right back to sleep again because they've got to go make the donuts, as the expression goes. So I don't know what we do to change that other than wake up more people faster. But how about going... I mean, my main thing is going in like kind of one direction and not in every direction. Mm. Sure, we can all be leaders and we're going somewhere, but like kind of have some sort of a focus and focusing on the enemy is what I'm saying. Mm. Well, the enemy is always going to be there. Yes, yes. May until I, until I, the last day. That's Carly it. Sunshine has a comment to that. I would like to comment on that just a little bit. I, I want everyone in this room to understand that all of you, because you're here, are the pioneers you guys right now are going to be the ones that are going to move into the future. You guys are steps ahead of everyone. And so I'm, I'm putting out a challenge right now. So this means we move forward and we respect each other. We don't attack each other. We're going to learn what we need to learn scientifically and figure out the mechanics of this earth. But you need to, we need to learn how to love each other so we can move forward and we can teach the rest of the world, teach the next generations. Uh, about the truth of this earth. Thank you, Carly. Beautifully put. And our last question, right over here. Hi, I'm Marlo from Chicago. Uh, I'd like to thank God first, all glory to the Most High, for getting us all here safe, for keeping us safe, and getting us all here safe. I'd also like to say I've been blessed to go to the Global and Flat Earth debate in Duluth, Georgia. I was blessed to go to Take On the World Conference uh, that NYSSTV and Chris and Liz Bailey threw in uh, Ohio. I'm blessed to be here with all of you. I wish I had enough courage to talk to you guys and stay at the hotel maybe next time. This thing is not going to stop growing. It is getting bigger. More people are more curious and they want to connect with people. It's been a lonely few years, and I'm glad to see more people come here. God bless all of you. Thank you, my love. And his dog, Shanti. Beautiful dog, German Shepherd. I guess that concludes our, our panel, and I hope everyone's enjoyed it. Maybe you have other questions, and you can feel free to approach any of the panelists at your leisure. We have a dinner. We've got a film from Robbie Davidson, and we have the infamous Flatty Awards with Mark Sargent and I that closes things out. And all sorts of fun to be had tonight because... I'm just sure there'll be a little bit of um, partying, whether it's alcohol or whether it's water tonight. And so I hope to see all of you in all of those events yet ahead for us. This has been momentous and we're going to do it all again next year, but even better. Thank you so much. <laughs>